Well, hello there. It's Corey Dowds of Eye of the Veda coming to you live from the western coast of India. Alright, so I wanted to talk a little bit about relocational astrology. Relocational astrology is the idea that it's a very modern form of astrology. And it's the idea that, you know, you can relocate or change your location and either your life will change or your fate will change or you will improve your karma or worsen it by where you move to. Uh, there are techniques both in Western tradition and in the Vedic tradition that deal with this. Though, in the old days, there was not as much of a chance for people to move or relocate. And so there was definitely not as much information about this in the old books. But nowadays in the modern world, people can just pack up and move and go somewhere else. And it's really quite easy and simple. So it kind of makes sense that it's gotten, it's become a more popular form of astrology in recent times. But I want to talk about it because, you know, I've, I've been traveling. So naturally people have been asking me stuff about it. And it's been coming up more in my readings as well. Um, so yeah, like what is, what is a Vedic astrologer to make of this idea of relocational astrology? Um, first off, like I'll just kind of explain a little bit about it. Like the main, the most popular version of relocational astrology is this thing called astrocartography. And it's essentially taking your birth chart and putting like putting that on a map and putting all the planets on the angles and like so the idea is that okay if you don't have sun in the 10th house you might want to feel that energy and so you could go to a certain part of the world where the sun would be on your 10th house okay and one thing that's really cool about this is that i mean there's definitely truth to it it definitely works to a certain degree but as you'll find out as i'm saying it needs to be like developed more and applied more um and some of the interpretations you'll see are just like very generic um and as you know if you follow my channel i'm very allergic to generic astrology <laughs> so yeah i've been looking into this a lot and uh yeah like in general uh my favorite technique is not astrocartography it is two jyotish techniques um one of them is a uh, kakini technique and one of them is about the declinations of the planets, which is kind of very similar to the astro cartography, but I actually think that it works better, at least in my research of things. This is the other thing. Astro cartography is perfect for this, like, their wacky millennial YouTube learning world of astrology because it's, like, so hard to really quantify yes or no if the thing is working. Like, for example, someone will tell me, like, oh, well, you know, I hung out with these people I went to a lot of parties on my Venus line, had a great time. Is that really like evidence? Like you might have just had a great time because you went and party and you had a great time. It's kind of like really hard to quantify. Uh, you know, you get these anecdotes from clients. Oh, well, I hung out with these people and it was really fun in my Mercury line. And oh, I had a bad day over here in my Saturn line. I don't know. Like that's not that's not objective enough really to be scientific, to even quantify it. So that gets tricky as well. So it is one of these things that's hard to measure. It's not like financial astrology where it's like, Bitcoin is either gonna go up or down on this day and you're either right or you're wrong. And I love stuff like that because I really find out if I'm right or not, you know? Uh, anyway, so so there's like there's a little bit of a tricky part to it with, with just studying and researching and figuring out if it works in general. But the main idea, astrocartography, is like, a, there's definitely got to be some truth to it, for sure. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it's it seems like people get really generic with it. Like, uh, my uh, my main teacher, Ernst Wilhelm, he li where he lives, that's where my Pluto line is. And someone was like, oh, you shouldn't go there. You shouldn't go back there and all this stuff because it's your Pluto line. It'll be terrible. And oh my God, those were like some of the most profound healing experiences I had. Some of the most empowering, transformative times. My Pluto is in the ninth house, too. And it's a very auspicious Pluto, and it was in a really auspicious transit as that happened. So, well, no, that's just a bunch of malarkey. Like, don't just make these generic uh, predictions based on something like that. So the first thing is, if you're doing astrocartography, 
look at the conditions and the avastas of the planets at birth in your chart and then predict based on that so if you have a debilitated mercury you're going to your mercury line is gonna things are gonna seem like they're really great but they're gonna not work out that well all the time which is the case for a debilitated mercury or really any anytime you have a debilitated benefic something like seems really great about it at first but then it doesn't pan out you know what i mean it doesn't end up being that great um so that's something that i think works pretty well like that kind of idea if you have a really strong mars you might really want to go to that mars line even if someone in the generic interpretation says that will make you more quarrelsome or give you more accidents or something uh like for example i have mars with rahu uh and it's a strong yoga karaka planet for me on a number of levels it's the one of the important planets for pisces rising but also in the jaimini system i have a bunch of yagoda raj yogas with mars so i don't know like People have tried to scare me away from Mars things a lot in my life, and it's just actually worked out amazing. Like being an extreme sports person, like skating and surfing, and people always told me I'd get injured and wouldn't be able to walk by the time I'm 30 for jumping down 15 stairs and stuff. And here I am at 36, healthier than those people were, you know. But uh, so, anyways, like that that this this astrocartography, it's it is very interesting. Um, I. I saw one Vedic astrologer do something really, really brilliant idea, I must say. He added in the idea of Digbala, because in Vedic astrology, we have certain planets, basically all the planets do the best in a certain direction, either in the first house, like Mercury and Jupiter, get full Digbala in the first Baba. So if you tried to put them in your first house, that would make sense logically, right? Or Mars and Sun are strongest in the 10th and then weakest in the fourth. So you might not want to go to your sun line on the fourth or the icy as they say in Western, but you might want to put, go to a place where the sun is in your mid heaven or Mars. And same with the other planet, Saturn, he's strongest in the seventh uh, and he's weakest in the first. So you maybe wouldn't want to go to a place with Saturn in the first. Um, Venus and moon are strongest in the fourth and then weakest in the 10th. So, you know, again, you might want to factor that in. I played around with that, but still that wasn't really satisfying me enough, to be completely honest. Um, I might just need to work on that more though. I might just need to research that more. This is all just stuff I've been researching in the last week or so. Um, and then, you know, you could have, I think the Avashtas really works the best so far with what I've seen, but then you could also factor in like just what planets are like yoga karakas for you, like sun, um, you know, like for a Leo rising, Mars is the yoga karaka plant. So you might actually want to move to your Mars line then. And it might be a more productive dharmic time for you than if, say, like a Virgo moved to their Mars line. Because Mars is a, is a really bad planet for Virgo in, in this sense. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely a lot of truth to it. But it's, as my teacher Ernst said once years ago, it was like relocation astro relocational astrology is just a very rajasic Thing. It's just a very rajasic form of astrology. What do I mean by that? Rajas guna, for those who aren't as familiar with yoga, there are three gunas, three threads, three things that pull us, literally strings. Guna means string or thre thread, and it's actually quite fascinating that uh, these gunas are in Sankhya philosophy. They, they talk about the creation of the world, and they talk about threads, gunas, because now modern-day physics people, what do they talk about? String theory strings threads same thing but anyways you've got a you know you've got three main threads three main things that will get you out of bed tomorrow you're either going to get out of bed because you know you're hot you're sweaty you're suffering the house is burning down you have to get out of bed that's the tamas guna tamo tamas is uh darkness inertia suffering basically you're motivated one reason we're motivated to do anything is to avoid suffering then there's Rajas Guna, and there's Sattva. Sattva is when you wake up just because you're inspired. You're just, oh, I can't wait to get up and make a video on relocational astrology today, you know? And you're just inspired to move, to get out of bed, or to do something. Rajas is when you're getting out of bed just because you feel like it's what you need to do, or, you because, or because of some ego idea that if I get out of bed, I'll have juice or food and I'll feel good, blah, blah, blah. It's not really because of suffering. It's not really because of inspiration either, though. Rajas literally means mist in Sanskrit. So it's literally the mist that makes that covers up the truth and makes you think you are the doer. And 
So rajas is like the ego, you know what I mean? That thinks we're the doer. If we study astrology or yoga philosophy, we know that we're really not the doer. We know that everything is Vishnu, everything is much more than this. Um, this idea that I can change my fate by just going to another city and oh, now all my bad karma just is gonna somehow be suspended up in heaven and I'm gonna live a perfect life and meet a perfect woman and do all this amazing perfect stuff. That's the silly naiveness that I think unfortunately appeals to a lot of people with re with this whole relocational astrology thing. Sorry, here's my face. Um, this whole, like, yeah, that's just a very rajasic idea. And astrologers are selling you on this. And don't listen to them. Don't buy into that, okay? Like, do not buy into this bullshit that, like, you can just, oh, like, make, you know, live in bliss and stuff because you moved to where your Jupiter line is. That's so not Jupiterian to like <laughs> to go some stranger tells you go move to this line you don't have any connection to it and you just follow his orders and you go there there's nothing sattvic or inspired or Jupiter like at all about that that probably worsens your Jupiter <laughs> in your chart for your, the rest of your karma for your next life so yeah there's you see what I'm saying like I don't know how to really convey this well and I didn't you know I'm not scripting this video I had a few notes here but yeah, I mean, I think this is why relocational astrology is so popular, because we live in such a rajasic age. Like, we live in such a rajasic time where people think they can just, oh, like, just get the app, and this will make you meditate, this will meditate for you, you know what I mean? Or do this and do that, and we don't really want to do, like, we don't, <laughs> we don't either want to do the hard tamasic work that it takes to really get somewhere, or we don't, for some reason, just don't have a lot of inspiration and we're acting out of this ego place of like the mist, the rajas that makes us think, oh, well, if I do this or do that, I'll somehow avoid my karma. If I just chant this mantra a hundred times, now everything's going to be fine. No, like mantras only work when you fully devote and fully get into a sattvic state with them and become that mantra and merge with that. And you forget about what results you want to have, you know? <sighs> So anyways, you can tell I'm like annoyed by that, but that's because a bunch of, since I've been in India, a bunch of people have been like, oh, I thought about going to India, but that's my Pluto line went here, or my Chiron line or my Saturn line. It's like, come on, dude, like go somewhere based on your inspiration, go somewhere based on your inner voice. I did, did I use astrology to come here? No, like I'm having the time of my life, but I did not use astrology and, or I didn't use either Vedic or Western relocation techniques. I went here because I was invited to for a wedding and then I had certain places I just felt called to in my inner voice to go to. And I went there and they were amazing. Simple enough. Like, it's just this whole problem where uh, we let fear, we let, never let astrology suppress your inner voice. Only let astrology support your inner voice and enhance it. And when it comes to your deep down feeling and inner voice versus what the chart says, your experience and your inner voice always trumps the chart. Always, no matter what. And so, yeah, it's just like, you know, like, I remember Ernst saying something about this years ago and it was really true to me and that's that, I'm glad he did, but he was saying like, you know, you're meant to live somewhere for your karma to unfold. Like maybe you're meant to get into an accident in some place where your Mars line is that you would have otherwise avoided out of fear because someone told you not to go there, but maybe you get into an accident and maybe you're in the hospital and maybe the nurse is the love of your life and you meet that nurse and then she nurses you back to health and you create the most profound relationship you've ever had. Why would you want to miss that? If that's what your fate's saying, you, you signed up for this. You took your first breath and signed up for this chart. You don't want to change it. Trust me, your, high, you, your ego might want to change it, but your higher self wants this or it wouldn't be happening. And that's just kind of my whole problem with the relocational astrology. Um, and I think this is why it's more popular than a lot of the other uh, like types of astrology that are based more on like healing our wounds and healing our psychology. Because that's really what you want to do with astrology is figure out your psychological issues, work with the therapist or healer over a period of time heal them and then move on with life and then therefore be able to hear your inner voice and be inspired and act freely in this world you know freedom moksha moksha and freedom is the same thing you want to be free um 
so anyways like i don't want to be too preachy here but that's just the thing i do not like i so since i've been studying relocation astrology i've read western astrologers eastern vedic astrologers and they just keep selling you on this idea that you can just be like blissed out if you go to the right place and i just think that's bullshit I've been here, I'm in a wonderful place, but my karmic issues are still there. I might be working them out more easily because I'm happy with my environment, but it's not that I'm changing my fate. Like this idea that you can just change your fate like by moving to another place, if that was the case, then astrology isn't even working. Astrology isn't even real. Your fate is your fate and it's what you're gonna experience either way. So if you move to another place, if I traveled to India, that was in my chart to come to India at this time. I didn't cheat. I didn't break out the cheat codes on the video game and like jump another level and I'm no longer doing that. No, and I wouldn't want to do that. You don't want to do that. <laughs> so that's my feelings on this whole idea is like, if you move to another place, that really was your fate to move to the other place. And that's how astrology works or else astrology doesn't work. And you essentially don't believe in astrology. You believe in it when you want to believe in it and then you decide you believe in another thing at another time and that's very rajasic as well so um we can see why this is so popular in this modern age as we start to think about it um but yeah so i do think that there's still a lot of truth to it but at the same time we need to do it within like kind of a more without this idea of like selling that you're going to change your karma or your fate the only thing I've ever found that actually really changes your karma is getting initiated into a true spiritual tradition or a true master, a true sadhguru, and devoting and surrendering yourself fully to them. In that case, something happens where your karma gets suspended. But then once you stop those practices or stop the Kriya Yoga or stop the being with that master, all your sanskaras get dumped back on you again. <laughs> so it only works if you're fully doing that for the rest of your life anyway. But yeah, so one of the ways that I think that we can really develop it is that we have to factor in the avashtas in the chart, um, whatever avashtas your planets have. Like I was saying earlier, like if going to a cruel, like the planet, the place of a cruel planet, well, if that cruel planet's really good for you, then that might be actually quite a good place to go. Um, and like I said, like adding in the digbala does seem really brilliant. Um, I still haven't really research that enough to be satisfied with it but if you guys have please let me know if you looked into this um i would be curious to know and another really interesting thing is that uh like ayanamsha doesn't matter so for astrocartography it doesn't matter whether you use tropical or sidereal zodiac or any of that it doesn't matter or any of the 16 other ayanamshas other than lahiri ayanamsha so because remember like I know I'm a tropical Vedic astrologer and you should always do what's best for you, but you know, the fact that the sidereal astrologers can't even agree on what Ayanamsha works and there's literally over more than 20 of them, I don't know. That's kind of a sign to me in itself. And you know, like Lahir Ayanamsha is most popular, but not the most accurate. It's what the Indian government uses. If you've been to India, you know you don't want to do anything the Indian government says or does that's not, it does not work well. Um, and they just picked that because they needed to just pick one so that all the government holidays would be at the same time. They didn't pick it because it was accurate. Um, anywho, uh, local space. It's a really cool idea. Local space is also how we do planetary war. That's really, really fascinating to me because planetary war, as you've seen, if you watched my previous videos about the, the planetary war of Saturn and Jupiter and the vaccine narrative and how they where, uh, you know, well, I shouldn't even talk about that or this video gets suppressed, but basically go back and watch that older video I did. I talked a lot about planetary war there. Planetary war or Graha Yudha is very unique to Vedic astrology and it works amazing for mundane astrology. So my idea is that, and I haven't worked this out enough, but there must, astrocartography would, is probably gonna be really important for mundane astrology. And I'm still not exactly sure how that will be worked out, but, I think that's a cool area of research for anyone watching this who would, would want to look into that. Because yeah, like local space, like for example, we just had these strange train crashes in Ohio and then in South Carolina and in I think somewhere in Texas in the United States, we had all these trains get derailed 
And I was like, gosh, must be something astrological about that. But why does it happen in those cities and nowhere else? Well, there's a Sun, Saturn, planetary war going on right now. And that must, and based on local space, which means as things look locally to you, certain parts of the planet, Saturn and Sun are gonna look very far away. Other parts of the planet, they're gonna look right next to each other and be truly in a Graha Yuda planetary war, but not all across the planet. This is why, you know, this is why these events happen there and not elsewhere. Or this is why there's maybe been no train crashes in India, you know, but there have been in the United States or why the riots happen in one city and not in another city. And this has been researched fully, like we know this, this is an established thing. I think that astrocartography needs to be plugged into that and be worked on with mundane astrology a lot. Perhaps this will give us hints as to why one nation goes to war with another rather than, you know, why, you know, we go to war with this country versus another. You see what I'm saying? Um, but this is just, you know, these are all just thoughts that I've had. Um, yeah, and I would be curious if any of you guys know of anyone or have worked with uh, study this or research this idea for like using astrocartography for mundane astrology. I think that that would be really, really cool. Now, um, yeah, so, so astrocartography, it is cool. We need to work on it more, develop it more. Um, the other, Jyotish though, has its own really cool two relocational astrology techniques that I've used for years for clients and nobody knows about these. <laughs> so I'll share these, or you know, relatively no one compared to astrocartography, is the declinations of the planets. You take the exact degree of the declination and you find where else, uh, where else that, or that like mathematical similarity would be on, in terms of like the latitude and stuff. And you can, you can find, oh, like uh, this place is, is gonna be like a moon energy for me. Uh, I forget the details on that because I would have to go back and, and read up on the details of that exactly how you calculate that and stuff but like I remember being really impressed with that like oh wow this is where my moon line was and this is where I got back into surfing or things like that that worked really well um and no one talks about it um and if you want I can you know email me or whatever I can share more info on that classes lessons whatever um and then the other one is the Kakini technique where you find out Based on the first syllable of your name and the first syllable of the city's name, you do a mathematical formula to find out whether you will gain coins or lose coins from that city and how much. And that's really cool. And I use that, uh, some of you may have watched that video I did with, um, well, I just various videos I've done on financial astrology, you've definitely heard me probably talk about this because the reason I got into financial astrology was because a client was like, I'm going to go to the casino, I'll give you 50% of my earnings, you know? And I was like, that's, that sounds good. By the way, if any of you guys ever want to do that, please hire me because it's really fun. But so I, I did a lot of work, you know, I, I found the right timing for him to, to go and gamble. I found the right casino by the name of his first name and the, the city's name and use this Kakini technique to find which ones he would gain the most from. And then, uh, you know, use a variety of other birth chart techniques and then use like the Maherta or timing of when to enter the city. And it was insane. I mean, the guy, he only played slots, which is complete chance. There's no skill whatsoever. And in just like one weekend, we, we walked away with $4,500, which was, you should not make that much by chance, just playing slots, especially your first time. And then he did another one and made, made not as much, but still made money. Um, a pretty good amount, more than a thousand. Um, so yeah, Kakini technique works for sure. And it, it shows either how much money or how much time you'll gain or lose from entering the city. And then also there are Tajika techniques like Prajna techniques that have to do with when you first enter a city, whether you'll spend a lot of time there, make money, do this or that. And so that's pretty cool too. So using all that together and Moherta, you could do some really great work. But at the end of the day, did I do that to come here? No, man, I just went with my inner voice and where I was called to go. And, you know, I'm a yogi first off and I'm not gonna just sit around and like, ah. like there's this problem with astro astrology and astrology lovers where they are afraid to take an action and they wanna use astrology to just tell them what action to take. But that's just life. Like a lot of actions are scary and we don't wanna take them 
first you have to take that action and then the gods will validate it or not validate it. You know, but first you have to take an action. You can't just sit there on the sidelines trying to analyze stuff all day long. That's too rajasic, again. So I hope that this helps you guys and I hope this is some good food for thought. Thanks you guys, take care.